Congressman Goss. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Director Tennant, how long have you been the DCI? Five years and a few months, sir. Uh, that gives you longevity on the panel, then, of uh, time held in the job. Is that correct? I believe so, yes, sir. How many DCIs were there immediately preceding you uh, in the period of the 90s? I believe it was uh, four in a period of seven years. Four in a period of seven years. So uh, we have five DCIs, and you've had 50 percent of that during the decade of the 90s. Is that about right? There's actually four in the 90s. Four DCIs in the 90s. Four. A lot of change going on. Some of those previous DCIs said that they didn't have much access uh, to the White House. Uh, I think some recall a joke about, now a bad joke, but a joke at the time about a small plane that crashed uh, near the White House uh, as the director of the DCI tried to get in to see the president. Do you remember that story going around? My question is, is, goes to this. You asked a, um, you made a, a comment about uh, the seriousness of this in the war. You certainly made it clear to the oversight committees. Uh, I don't think there's any mystery in the oversight committees, those of us who were also here uh, during the longevity of your tenure, uh, about this problem. There's really not a whole lot new that's come out of this for those of us who have been focused on it. My, my question that has haunted me, and I imagine has haunted you, is how come nobody listened in 98 at the right level? Why didn't we get out of OMB, why did not we get out of the people who are making the decisions an awareness that we needed to reinvest, that we were dangerously underinvested, that we were letting capabilities slide, that our technology was falling behind? It was clear. I would, I'd love to have your answer, and, and I would be very happy to have uh, Director Muller's and uh, General Hayden's as well, but I, I'm not sure Director Muller Look, sir, uh, had been there long enough. I, I, can't, I, can't speak, I can't speak to what the reaction was to our requests. I, I think that you, know, you really have to talk to people who are making judgments on what we were asking for. Um, I think that uh, this is an endeavor where if you don't make the investments, um, you know, you, you, can't, you can't function at the level you need to function at. I think we made that case as compellingly as we possibly could. And I believe that, uh, you know, it, whether there was a deficit that was at stake, whether there were budget caps that were at stake, whatever the reasoning was, whatever the, we, we, we just needed more support than we received. What's the primary function of the federal government? It is national security, isn't it? Security. Guarantee yeah. the safety and well-being, liberty of the people of the United States of America? Yes, sir. Okay. It, shouldn't that be job one? And shouldn't the leaders be listening? Okay, my second question then. General Hayden, you said something uh, about Ben Laden coming across the bridge. Uh, hypothetical, of course. But uh, I take that to mean that if Ben Laden did come, there would be capabilities that we have that we can use elsewhere in the world that we cannot use in the United States of America. Is that correct? Not so much capabilities, but how agilely we could apply those capabilities. The person inside the United States becomes a a U.S. person under the definition provided by the FISA Act. Special protections, according and to your special testimony. Special protections then apply. It is, there are procedural steps that one can identify such a person as the agent of a foreign power, but one's got to go through those procedural steps. Now, take that metaphor and apply it to somebody without the persona of Osama bin Laden, and you can see the challenge of trying to cover people inside, inside U.S. borders, <clears throat> even if they will us harm. Well, let's, again, I don't want to get into details. I'm aware of the public nature of this meeting, but let's just suppose this sniper is somebody we wanted to catch very badly. Could we apply all our technologies and all our capabilities and all our know-how uh, against that person, or would that person be uh, as considered to have protection as an American citizen? It, 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 that person would have protections as what the law defines as a U.S. person, and I would have no authorities to, to pursue him. So the answer is that person has some protections just by being in the United States of America. And if that act were actually taking place overseas, we would be able to bring more to bear Absolutely. to deal with it. That's that a fair statement? Yes, sir. That's right. Like, I'm not sure everybody in this country understands just how many safeguards we have for American liberties. And I think it's very important to underscore that. There is a price for it. And we are trying to find the balance and what that price is. And I appreciate your answer to the question. Sure. Uh, Finally, uh, Director Tennant, uh, you didn't seem satisfied with the amount of time you had to answer a question of some dispute about a matter in New York. Would you care to use the time to elaborate? 
Not at this moment, sir. I think that there is a uh, – we have a different view of what happened there, but let's, let's well, work through that. For your, uh, for your uh, comfort zone, let me tell you that I think that we do understand that there are two stories, and uh, when you put it all together, there, it does make some sense to what different people who are doing their job responsibly thought, and I don't find an inconsistency in it. Um, the last question, uh, which I will not ask because my time is expired. Thank you.